welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, Challenges to Consider When Pursuing Laboratory Inventory Management. I'm Kay Bechtold, Senior Editor of the Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for participating, and especially the SO Systems for sponsoring today's webinar. Our presenter today is Anne Seafried, who is currently the Product Manager for Biovia Cisco. She has been with the SO for 14 years, the first 10 of which were spent between the support and pre-sales organizations, implementing training and supporting CISPRO for customers across disciplines and industries. Prior to joining the SO, she served in the United States Air Force, where she spent four years as an intelligence imagery analyst. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Anne. Thank you, Kate, and thanks for everyone that has joined today. Um, trying to pick out a topic for today's presentation earlier in the year, um, I thought w would be helpful um, would be to go over some things that we've learned in working through customers and what I've spent probably almost a good, the good last 15 years of my pro professional career um, working on, which is, is implementing uh, inventory systems for specific for, uh, laboratories. Um, and not to point out what they did wrong, but really to help lead people, because a lot of times when people come to us, um, Probably the biggest way to summarize it is the focus is wrong. Um, to actually readjust the thinking of the people that we're working with. So I'm assuming if you're joining it, you work in a lab, um, and as such, you know there's actually a large number of challenges um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, in years past, one of the biggest pain points was sharing knowledge because everyone captured their data in different formats, in different places which led to significant amounts of duplicated work because there's no way to know, for example, what tests had been performed, what results have been captured, and this ended up being, you know, causing labs to actually order more materials, produce the same test because not only two people in one site or two people across a company or even across a large organization um, were duplicating unnecessary work. Um, as technology has become available to support the lab, systems are often still disconnected um, because for reasons like uh, designed by different companies, um, having the wrong people drive the decisions. A lot of times um, we're working, for example, with the procurement department, and in the back, the back of your mind you're thinking, well, why are you driving the decision um, to make decisions, or how are you making decisions for a scientist, for example, with a very special work workflow? Um, or a lot of times it's IT, you know, instead of scientists, and both these things can cause a number of issues. Um, as companies expand from local to global markets, uh, both the demand for streamlined research and development and the pressure of increasing compliance makes it difficult to um, grow. Things like budget cuts, disconnects from systems, and inefficient processes contribute to the difficulty of achieving success in a lab. And we can all agree that there are many challenges facing a lab, and today we're specifically going to focus on a single and very important piece, which is actually the management of materials inventory um, for the lab. Uh, customers have been looking uh, for ways to easily manage inventory uh, for as long as I can remember. Obviously, 15 years, but it's been much longer than that. One of the biggest challenges customers face is the misconception that it would be simple because it's just an inventory. What's interesting is I came from a small company or twice in the last uh, 15 years, and even within our own organization, sometimes it's just looked upon as it's just inventory. Um, everything a lab does, I mean, if you really think about it, regardless of what industry you're part of, is based on materials. Everything in science is based on the materials, and it starts with the inventory. This includes materials that you purchase, uh, materials that you're in the process of developing, uh, materials that you're actually putting into production and selling on the market. When we think of inventory, we often only think about the inventory workflow as described here on the screen. I'm procuring it or starting with the search, you know, what do I need? What might produce the result that I'm looking for? Where can I get it? Receiving it, labeling it, using it disposing it when you're done, and then starting that process again. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's much larger than that. Uh, what this doesn't take into consideration is <clears throat> all the other connection points to systems that are in place to manage the work that is actually done using the materials that are actually being managed by the inventory system. So things like chemical and biological registration systems, electronic lab notebooks, uh, batch execution systems, lot testing and, and qualification, results entry, uh, the, the list goes on. Um, to be successful in a lab, you really need to understand how all these systems can and should be connected um, to re reduce the duplication of effort and errors due to manual processes. You 
you know, the last thing that we want to see is you log into one system, type in a long chemical name, go to the next step, log into another system, retype that same chemical name. Um, the chance for growth and errors across multiple systems when it's not connected um, is significant, especially if we're not talking about a single lab, but uh, maybe a company that has 19 sites in 25 countries around the world. So large room for growth, um, for errors. <clears throat> so if we sharpen our focus and move it back to just chemical, or I'm sorry, materials inventory management, you'll still find a long list of issues, although I've tried to shorten it here. From our perspective, there are two primary groups that really need to be met by, or could be met by the same set of information. Um, over time, we've confirmed over and over again that if you can address the logistical needs of the lab in order to you know, think about what do I have, how much, um, do I have what I need for my work next week, those kind of questions, then you can easily meet the needs of the safety group. Um, as a lab manager, I need to ensure I have the right materials available at the right time. End users obviously can't do work if the materials are not available. Um, yet on the flip side, if I'm over-ordering materials and things end up going expired, that has an adverse cost effect as well because then you have to think about how you're going to dispose them, especially if they have, um, you know, if you have requirements to dispose things like peroxide formers. Um, using outdated or disconnected systems can lead to duplicate data entry errors and put end users in a position to exert uh, the least amount of effort. So at the end of the day, if I make it really, really hard um, for someone to do their job, we all know they're not going to do it. So we have to be thinking ahead, thinking about how to reduce the level of effort, reduce any type of duplicate entry that a person would have to do, and ensure that the system or the solution that you're looking for um, meets a lot of needs. Additionally, we have a, a landscape today of ever-increasing regulations, as you probably all know. Um, that govern the management of materials, and it can become impossible to manage putting uh, employees and companies at risk. And in the competitive world that we all live in, uh, customers cannot chance the cost of incidents like exposures, fires, explosions, or accidents that end up resulting in damage to buildings, injury, or even death. I mean, just the news that would go from that, the cost, the lawsuits, everything is, is um, staggering, and it's just too high. It's not something that we can risk. For our presentation today, I'd like to focus on the challenges to consider for and selecting materials, uh, a materials management system. As you can see on the screen, there are a variety of topics that we'll dive into based on communications and feedback we've received over the years, including things like the scope of your project, um, making sure it's understood up front, understanding who um, within the organization will participate um, and why that makes, a, why that's a big deal, um, and what role each person will play, ensuring that everyone that's making the selection has the big picture in mind. So first off, we'll talk about scope. And even this one little word, um, there's a lot of different ways to discuss scope in terms of materials management. I'd like to highlight a few examples today. Um, this can include things like understanding what type of materials you're looking to manage, um, what part of, of the organization will be involved or use the solution, and we'll need the information from the solution. So not just what I'm going to put into it, but who's actually consuming data, because it can be a lot of um, different uh, groups within the organization. Um, the role of the individual researching solution can actually have a big impact on what requirements initially look like and how broad the scope is. So um, depending on who we're talking to, sometimes we're talking to a lab manager, sometimes we're talking to the H&S, sometimes it might be an individual researcher who can tell that they, you know, things would be better if I could just have better control of my inventory. Um, are you looking to manage chemicals like substances, make sure clinical supplies control substances? Um, are you looking biological materials management, like blood and plasmas, RNA, DNA, peptides, or protein, um, ingredients like raw materials, flavors, colors, or pigments, or supply items like packing uh, supplies, gloves, coats. Um, if you can understand all the different things that could come into play, um, you can make a better and better informed decision um, to select the right need for all of these different things. Because as you imagine, I'm not going to be tracking a cast number for a pair of gloves. Um, but from a making sure we have all the information or all the materials we need to perform an experiment, for example, I might need the castner of the acetone as well as the box of gloves to make sure I'm working safely. So you have needs across different material types that requires different types of data. So when the selection process is being driven by EHS, the requirements are strongly focused on an overall concept of hazardous materials, which obviously makes sense we can understand. 
definitely agree that managing hazardous materials is extremely important. And there are a lot of features and functionality out there that must be available within the solution you're looking for to meet these needs. Um, what's important to understand is that sometimes this focus overlooks a lot of the other materials that are commonly used in a lab that also need to be tracked in order to meet the logistical needs of the end user. So if you need to the gloves or um, pipette tips or a lab coat you know, or, or anything else. Um, a lot of times I need time and I need a refrigerator or an oven or an HPLC machine. I need all kinds of things, materials, covers a, a wide range of things. So when I think about inventory, if my focus isn't just on hazardous materials, then I'm kind of overlooking a lot of things that actually could come into play when selecting a solution. Um, <clears throat> I worked with a customer probably two to three years ago who took it even a little bit farther to not just say hazardous materials, um, but they went out and actually had an audit done by a local fire marshal. And they were specifically looking to track flammable materials which makes sense if someone came in and found that you're storing way too many flammable liquids and determined that, you know, based on your location being close to a housing area, this is actually a really bad thing. And so you had to sign agreements that you're going to go resolve these issues. And part of that was putting a better system in place for tracking. Um, the focus comes in way too small. I just want to track flammable materials. And what we found is then it turned into this really large decision tree, you know, for this poor guy that works in the shipping receiving dock is, First off, how do I determine if it's flammable? And depending on who you talk to, it can vary. It might be a DHS classification, it might be an NFPA value, it might be a specific fl um, flash point. And then the next thing you hear is, well, I don't care about it unless it's greater than, than some quantity. And I'll use the example of 500 milliliters. Well, overall, we all know that you know, by the time you put 100 to 500 milliliter um, containers in inventory, you can quickly start adding up. So all of a sudden, you're, you're decisions in the hand of someone that shouldn't be making them. Um, but also, just because we've been doing this so long, we also understand that at the end of the day, the minute you accomplish tracking or getting a good handle on tracking your flammable liquids or materials overall, all of a sudden you realize, well, gosh, it would be great if I could track my um, combustible, my water reactives, my peroxides, and you start over. So now if you look across your environment, you have one-tenth of your inventory accounted for, and the process starts over, becomes broader when, at the end of the day, really our recommendation would be when you start, look at the broad picture. Don't just track one thing, but think about how do you account for everything so that down the road, when you turn around, you have everything you need. Um, similar to the focus only beyond flammable materials, sometimes the group that we're talking to is looking to manage uh, inventory that's on large quantities and small volumes, um, things that require uh, to be in a freezer, for example. Uh, at the end of the day, the requirements in terms of tracking what the material is, the hazardous information, whether it's you know, biosafety levels instead of flammability, um, or how much is inventory exactly the same. Whether it's in the freezer or it's on the shelf, it's, I still need to know exactly what it is, how much, where it is. Um, but the actual functionality can be very different. Um, the difference in this case comes in when you start to understand that container-based tracking for barcodes is efficient when dealing with large containers, a four liter bottle with a barcode on it, I know exactly that that, you know, let's say methanol is sitting on the shelf in this lab, very easy to do. But if I have 1,500 vials of a material, say let's say lot number one, and it's spread across um, 12 different boxes in two different freezers, um, and even in those boxes, they might be mixed different lots together, the need is very different. Whereas with a large container, I might need to know exactly that this container is barcode one. Um, when I'm dealing with freezers, I might not care. I might need to understand this whole box contains 10 of lot one and then where they are, individual spaces, but not need to be able to differentiate from one container barcode to the next. I know it's a lot of information just for one slide, but it's very important to understand the difference and to, to consider the fact that if I'm managing inventories in the freezer, chances are I'm still managing the other type of materials that are outside the freezer. And if I can, I'd like to do those things together so that we're using the same type of system, just different functionality within the same. <clears throat> From the previous examples, you'll see that oftentimes you're faced with a focus that is far too small. So if you go out looking just for a flammable materials inventory system, if you go out and look just for a freezer management system, or in this case, we've got customers that um, all of a sudden the focus has been lately on controlled substances and traceability, accountability, signatures, um, tracing lots in terms of recalls and accountability for 
for DEA, for example, um, still the same, still materials. Some are more hazardous than others. We need to know how much is there, when it was received, the registration number it was received on, who you were receiving it from, if it changes over time. Um, but at the end of the day, I need to know how much it has. And the requirements for tracking might become more stringent. I might need to limit who can actually access them, who can receive them, who can label them, who can check them out of a locked cabinet and move them to an area for use. And then once I'm actually using them, I might need to be able to put in signature events to say that, yes, I dispensed X amount of this amount. During this process, I lost five milligrams. And I need to account for that difference. So features and functions are very, very similar, similar but I might deploy them a little bit differently. So really just talking about the fact that there's a lot of different ways to look at materials and to keep in mind that there's systems out there that can do a wide range of these functions within um, a, si a single system. Um, at the end of the day, probably what most people think about when I mention scope is who am I buying this system for? You know, I'm in, I'm in the researcher in the lab, the new guy that's trying to, you know, make changes and, and be more modern. Um, is it a full site? Um, we've maybe had a directive, um, a lab manager trying to make a difference for their lab, an initiative driven by a specific department like analytical chemistry, or a business like beauty care, um, or even, like I said, a directive to improve worker safety and compliance. <clears throat> it's always okay to select a solution at any of these levels, but what we're trying to point out is that you need to understand the bigger picture and find out, for example, what others are doing. If I'm cur currently using a commercial off-the-shelf system, is it working for me? Um, what does work, what doesn't work? Um, if I'm not using it, hey, what are the things that could help you if you could implement the system? Um, and just kind of have that broader picture of, you know, who all could benefit the, from this? The entire organization, just my site, just my lab, you know, understanding your scope. What is it exactly you're looking for? And um, think big. Remember that bringing a comprehensive solution in-house can provide tremendous benefit, but requires the support of lots of key players and guidance. Um, is often required the larger you get. So when we're you know, talking about a single site system in a single lab, obviously it's pretty easy because probably Jim manages the inventory and Jim has permission to do everything. Well, um, if you have a site, you have a little bit of controls in the place, but the minute you start using a system that crosses sites, crosses uh, business units, crosses different material types, um, a lot of times we'll work with customers to make sure they have internal governance that meets and ensures that if one group decides that they absolutely require a signature event on the receipt of inventory, and this will affect every other person, so maybe you have three people that need the, the signature event, and the other 3,000 don't, you don't want to just enable that type of uh, within the software, but the software or solution should be flexible to support both of these different requirements. The next topic I will cover is really around the approval of materials. Um, it's always an interesting subject, and while I was dialed in waiting for the call, um, I saw that someone else was actually going to talk about adding logic back into approvals, which I think is interesting to dial into. Um, a lot of times when customers provide us with a list of requirements, we get line items. Must include approvals. And you look at that and think, well, there's not very much details. I mean, that could be as simple as if I put it in the system, it's approved. If it's not approved, don't put it in the system. A little bit more advanced and say, okay, well, I have a checkbox that only a certain person can check, and if they just review it and box and approve. Um, you need much more detail than that to be able to answer a lot of functionality, not just approvals, but that's just an example. Um, it's an important topic, it can be broad, it can be tall in scope, um, and it's very hard to address the actual requirements if they're not clear. And sometimes, depending on who you're talking to, um, I might have gone out and sent out a survey saying, hey, we're going to implement the system, give us your requirements, someone somewhere slaps on this requirement and says material approvals. Um, but without getting more details, it's very hard on any system, any, any solution to address that type of thing. So really, you know, you need to start digging in as to, you know, what is it based on, you know, what are you currently doing? Um, what's the dream state, I think, is the most important thing, because what we run into often is people trying to simply replace exactly what they're doing regardless of how broken it is. Um, and I pause that way just because it's not just with approvals, but it's, you know, who does what, you know, what people do we have involved. Um, the 
requiring data that's not actually required. There's a lot of places where we see it. this is what I'm doing today. I need to take a paper-based process and replace it with an electronic process, realizing or not realizing that those are actually completely um, different things, and we should actually consider how we would change that. What would we do better if we have the opportunity to do so? Um, so really, to what extent does a material need approval? Uh, if the material is not approved, should it even be entered in the system? Sometimes we get customers say that, nope, it doesn't go in there. Others will say, yes, it does go in there. Um, if it's not entered in the system, how would others know that it's not approved? Imagine um, every time I want a material, I log in, I search, and if I don't find it, then the next step is for me to enter it. Where if over the course of the last five years, maybe five other people have already tried to get that material approved and it's been declined, if it's not in the system to show requested, it was denied, then you're do making me do work that I shouldn't have to. So you know, considering whether or not, you know, or how your process, process would work to account for things that have already been declined and why, and whether or not a previous um, denial should prevent someone else from being able to just easily say, I'd like to request this for this reason, because maybe it was de declined for one purpose in one site, but it's okay somewhere else. So just kind of understanding uh, the big picture of how you want that approval process to work. Um, <clears throat> if you're looking for a system that should include approvals for materials, First, should research exactly how it's done um, and how they work. Often this should start with understanding what's in place, what's working well, as I mentioned before, what could use improvement. Um, but also, if you think back to the scope question, um, how and where the solution will be used will have a great impact on approvals. Um, and we see this, it's, it's interesting how we talk to different people and they, you, know, you don't think big enough and if I have something and it's approved on my site, system, we're good to go. Anybody that wants it can have it. Um, you extend that scope to a global solution and you have a, another person in another site that from a safety perspective, the approval might be fine. Yes, it's safe enough, but from a shipping cost, from a timing perspective, um, it's not approved. And it's a whole different type of approval. Um, and so the bigger you get in scope in selecting a system, um, you need to take a lot of different considerations into how they would play, you know, who can approve. Is it based on a location? Is it based on a person? Um, is it based on a lab, a group, or sometimes even very, very specific? It's approved for this person in this lab for this very specific purpose. Um, so there's a lot of different things to consider versus just throwing a bullet line or just, you know, bringing to the table to someone that's trying to help meet your needs and match them to a solution. I need approvals. A lot more to it to consider. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, it's important to consider how the approval process will affect the end user requesting materials, especially ones that are routine, um, commonly used, non-hazardous, and being able to help automate that. So, you know, thinking about as an end user, I don't want to fill in the form. If the material's already been declined, I don't want to even go through the process of filling out the information. Um, if I've already been approved for the material, can I have it again? Or do I have to resubmit the same form? And hopefully, from a systems perspective, I'm not re-entering data. I'm just simply locating the record and saying request, everything's filled in, submit, and then uh, hopefully it can be automated. So depending on level of hazard, um, level of quantities on site, um, things like that, you can automate it. So if there's no hazards, it has a flag to say it's already been pre-approved. Um, it's a simple process, and we don't have to bog down EHS with with uh, unnecessary uh, duplicate approvals. Let's see, one of the things that's been interesting is also considering you know a lot of times people just put out an approval process and say, okay, well it's based on Anne, and Anne can have X amount in her lab for this purpose, and the next time she needs something, she has to refill out a form and go through the entire process again, which is lots of work for Anne and lots of work for EHS and everyone else. Facilities management, whoever else might be um, involved in that process. Um, what's more important is to understand the bigger picture and taking into account data that should be there. So if I if, if the data is available to make an informed decision, can I access this information? So if I'm asking for some quantity of methanol and methanol happens to be a flammable liquid, I work in a specific control zone. Um, the approval can't just be based on what I have because maybe what I have would never put me past that limit. Maybe what's used by myself and others in my lab still might not put me past the limit. So 
when you look at EHS and you bring their involvement in, it's looking at a broader picture of what's in the control zone. If I order X amount of a flammable liquid, and I take that amount and add it to what's currently there in terms of flammable liquids for that specific zone, am I still within compliance? Because what matters is ensuring that whatever we bring on site in terms of approvals doesn't make us exceed some maximum amount of quantity, which then we have to do other diversionary actions. So again, just uh, trying to point out a lot of different things that should and could come into play if you have a system in place that really understands you know, what your business process is and what things you want to consider in reviewing the request for materials, whether they're brand new, never been here, or they're things we've had, but in terms of control zones, fire code reporting, you know, DEA, there's all kinds of regulations out there. Um, we want to look at the broader picture of what's actually around you as well. Um, after you think about all those considerations, it's interesting how many customers will come to us and say, yep, we've got the greatest approval process, it's in place, everything's working. Um, and then you ask them, well, what, what happens when something that shows up that's not approved? They just kind of look at you like, well, it, it says it's for Bob Smith and it gets delivered to Bob Smith. Well, that's a huge, huge gap. So if you're going to implement approvals, make sure that the, the process, the whole picture um, is in place. Um, otherwise, no solution will actually solve your problems. If materials approvals are required, there should be a stopgap that prevents materials from, um, sorry, without approval from being received and delivered without additional review. Um, so really, if an unexpected item or something that's unapproved is received, it should be very easy for my shipping and receiving person to understand, you know, checking the system, if there's a PO that's not here, I can't tell that it's expected. Um, I have a way to safely place it to the side, reach out and contact someone that should be responsible as a person to order or EHS so that they can determine what should be handled, what, what should happen with that material. Maybe you get the approval process after the fact and then go back and tell that person, hey, let's not do this. Um, a lot of things come into play, but one of these things, this is one of the things that a lot of customers are, are moving towards implementing, make sure they have some type of process or quarantine area to stop things from just going on if you have an approval process and want to actually follow it. Um, in order to successfully meet the needs of both the lab and the HS, the process of data entry and maintenance is a critical factor. So with the approval process in place, which once you understand what it is that we're tracking, um, the next thing is understanding how to get that data into the, into the system successfully so that people use it and we can meet all of our needs. Um, so as we discussed earlier in terms of scope, understanding what types of materials are being tracked is important because the type of materials being tracked by the solution will help determine what information needs to be tracked and ensure that the appropriate data fields are available to store the information. Obviously, if you want to track cast number, the data system should have cast numbers that can track it. But it's also important that it's at the right place. It's always a mixture, then I want to know the constituent level information, the cast number, not on the material. So it does actually make a difference in terms of reporting. Um, see the data sheets, you know, so if you're thinking about chemicals, you're talking about safety data sheets, you're talking about EHS classifications. If I'm talking about biological materials, I might be interested in tracking biosafety levels, vectors, species, origins, viscosity, you know, a whole, a whole range of different information. So it's important to understand what's tracked for various different types of information and make sure that the solution um, can account for all those various differences. Um, and if they were to drill in, you know, when dealing with a broad range of material types, there can be a large number of data fields, and the end users might be interested only in inventory, may not be interested in supplying material density, for example. Although when it comes to reporting, if the Department of Homeland Security has said, I want everything reported in totals in pounds, well, data like density, um, specific gravity becomes very important, having conversion factors in the system so that I can take a wide range of quantities and units of measure, convert them very easily to a common unit such as pounds, and then produce the report so I can be in compliance with the specific regulation. So understand that in any given system, the wide range of material types, there's a lot of different data and not everybody cares about all the data and that can cause a significant challenge. Um, if you go in and say, my scientist has put all this information in, they care about 3%, I care about 97%, asking them to do all the work might not be the right way to gain adoption. Um, 
because there's so much information to capture and, and it's needed by a whole different set of users, it's often difficult to determine who is responsible, um, understanding uh, where you can get this information. Um, a lot of times, at least in the past, years and years ago when I first started working with inventory, um, people were kind of okay with the fact that acetone generally has common structure, has common uh, flammability ratings, you know, things that I can rely on. Um, but most of the time, people don't deliver you pure compounds. So if you're dealing with um, acetone, you might have it in 50%, which is going to have very different ratings than acetone at 99%. And so it's important to understand what the supplier has provided, what they're telling you the material is, what its hazard ratings are, DHS classifications, um, and you need to track that information. So understanding, you know, can you get that information from the supplier? Are they providing it in some way that you can consume it? Is it an entire um, full data entry process for every material you receive? Or taking into account, um, out there on the market, there's a variety of content resources. So does the solution that you're looking at include the ability to have content that helps populate and create new materials for the first time to eliminate um, materials from taking a lot of time to get into the system? Because even though it's acetone from one company like Sigma, acetone from another company like uh, Fisher Scientific, um, the data can be even just slightly different, and you're supposed to track what's from the supplier. So understanding how much is available, even if you have a connected system like a commercial off-shelf SDS system, um, can the data be incorporated? Can we sync data together to help populate the information? And probably at the end of the day, realizing that regardless of how much data you can get from a content system, how much data you can actually get from an SDS, there's always additional data fields um, that are needed to be populated that are not available from those various sources. Um, it's, every, it's kind of we see things happen in, in waves. People want to start talking about uh, controlled substances and advanced management. People want to talk about freezer management. People want to talk about consistency. And more and more customers are interested in tracking and managing the consistency of both source materials, you know, what they're ordering, um, as well as the materials they're creating. And this is important for a number of reasons in reporting and hazards and especially in formulation of new materials. Um, because if you're considering selling in a, in a global market, obviously you have to understand that different, uh, different companies have different regulations. And something that might be okay at a 5% ingredient in the United States uh, might not be okay in another country. And so understand the constituency not only of the materials that you're receiving, but how those play into the materials that you're making um, becomes very, very important. Um, but if you know anything about systems and this kind of data, this can be very time consuming. So very, very, very important, um, but a lot of work. You know, who, understanding who's gonna own it, you know, data provides great benefit, can often require a significant amount of effort um, because any given material can have one to a hundred constituents or more, and getting that data into the system can require a lot of different time. So again, just understanding, you know, do you guys want to track this information for what set of materials, you know, who's is it meeting? Asking those questions to the various different people that are in the inventory program. Um, important to understand that only so much data can be automatically entered, and it'll always be filled. So I'm gonna use an example. Um, we have a lot of customers, uh, California-based, Texas-based, um, even national, that barcode reporting is, is critical to what they do and making sure they're within the maximum allowable quantities for specific zones. At the end of the day, an SDS does not have that information. So although the information is available, as I mentioned before, you know, for acetone, we know specifically at 100% as a pure compound what the hazard rating is. The minute acetone is part of a mixture or solution, um, its amount is different. And so when it comes to reporting, we have tools to help from a pure compound standpoint, point, and we know other customers do as well. Um, but for individual materials that you've ordered that are mixtures or individual materials that you're actually making, it's a little bit harder. So I can get all the data from an SDS, populate a brand new material. At the end of the day, I still need someone that goes in, looks at the material, um, makes a determination as to what the hazard classes are. So that when EHS runs that report to monitor total quantities in a control zone, um, the materials are being reported correctly and under the right um, hazardous classification. So always, regardless of what anybody tells you, there's always data that cannot come from some content and will require 
data entry from our person is automatic. Everyone wants it. Um, in my 15 years, we, we've gotten close. We've seen a lot of really cool solutions coming out in the market that, that can help with automation, but there's still things that need to be owned by a person um, that can make critical decisions about the materials in your inventory. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about um, is multiple points of entry. Because at the end of the day, material defi definition and oversight is probably the most critical thing because everybody that needs data from the system relies on data being in and being accurate. So material definition is very different from uh, inventory receipt, if that makes sense. What is acetone? What are its hazard ratings? How is it classified from a uh, fire code perspective, what are the GHS information, what's the structure look like, you know, all these, these different details that are material specific. And then we start talking about, well, how does that inventory um, make it onto your site? So, probably a, a loaded question, or what you might consider a trick question. We always go in and ask, you know, how are materials entering the facility? And what's interesting is we usually get two answers, not a variety, but two. Um, either you're going to tell me that everything's centralized and you've done a lot of work to get it that way because that is a lot of work to make the changes that need to be adopted, or you're decentralized and we just kind of, people do whatever and we do the best. Um, completely centralized or one point or completely decentralized, those are the two options normally we hear. Um, but the reality is that it's never that simple and it's very important when you consider the your approval process, your quarantine, state entry. Um, we really need to dig in on this point. And usually it comes to light when we're doing this or having this conversation with the customer that um, some level can be in place. I might have controls in place, um, but there's still materials that find their way directly into labs without any identification or data entry for tracking. So I go to do an audit. Um, I find 22 samples. I find some random things I didn't know they were there. And you will realize that there are materials coming in and making it in your labs without being accounted for. Um, it can be things like, uh, purchasedly local on PCAR. I was on my way to work and needed some paint you know, to test some something. Um, I stopped at the local hardware store. Or uh, I needed some sugar because I'm actually working with chocolate and I just needed more because I was running low. Um, or a provider that you're working with provides you samples. You stop by to say hi, knock on your door, hand you some samples, went on their way. Um, things come on site in a variety of different ways. Um, but the most important thing we've found is besides understanding how it works, is understanding how it should work and what changes you might want to take um, to account for the data entry. Because uh, as I mentioned, materials in the first time, key and critical, but then tracking the stuff as it actually shows up um, is the next uh, biggest issue. So thinking about who is responsible for um, capturing that data. So once you've actually identified all the points of entry, need to understand who will be receiving the shipments and what are they responsible for in terms of data entry, in terms of labeling and delivery. Some materials are hazardous and the shipping and receiving person is not even qualified to do much more than sign off on the sheet to say that it's received and then move it on to the next person. Some materials are often um, packed or shipped in multiple containers. So I've got a, a four by four, four four liters in a single box and I don't need my shipping and receiving person to open them. I just need to have them confirm that yes, I received four print out four labels and fix them to the side. That way they're accounted for, they're recorded, but there wasn't really much my uh, shipping receiving doc um, had to do. So making it easy enough for the people doing the receiving um, to do their job and not causing any delays, but also realizing that you don't want that person who's not a chemist or not a researcher to be responsible for entering things like cast numbers or constituencies, GHS information, any of the things that actually is needed for the actual inventory. So two very, very different roles. Um, within the system. SDS management, can't have a conversation about inventory of materials in laboratories without talking about um, the core requirement of SDS management. So I bring this slide up because at the end of the day what I'm trying to say is that SDS is important at every step of the process when it comes to chemical inventory management. Um, if you're managing chemicals at all, you're always required to track the SDSs and ensure that you have the most up-to-date supplier-specific safety data sheet. Um, whether I'm requesting it for the first time you know, and giving someone the SDS so they can make that approval as an informed decision, whether I'm the person receiving it and you open it and realize the container's cracked and it's part of it got out and they just need to know, you know how 
how dangerous is this stuff? I'm in a personal lab. Um, this might be a visitor who stopped by and something was stepped out and they, they touched it or an emergency response team has come in and they just need to review it. There's there's so much information in, across the board, every part of the process, those SDSs um, are critical, a critical part of the workflow when it comes to managing S, uh, materials inventory and should be accounted for in a significant way when you're considering a solution. Um, as with the other points, whether we're talking about approvals, we're talking about, you know, what systems are currently in place, SDS is no different. You know, what do you currently do today? Um, you'd be surprised how many people are still using binders, but they are uh, very, very hard to manage, very time consuming, and probably it doesn't get done as much because it's so hard to do. So going from a, a binder-based system to an electronic system is, is a huge value to everybody, um, but it can take a lot of time. And then when you're considering that, you know, what are we currently doing? What could we do better? Um, who's responsible as well? Um, is it the researcher? You know, if I if I have acetone sigma and I it's used in 72 different labs, I obviously don't want to ask every researcher to be responsible for reviewing it up to the SDS because really it takes one person to review that SDS. Um, is it the lab manager's job because it could there could be duplication from lab to lab with the DHS? I don't know. It really depends. That's completely your choice. Um, but tr just trying to make sure you understand what you're currently doing, understanding it's an important need, and talking about you know who should be responsible, how do we streamline this, make it um, simple, make it part of the process. We talk about material approvals. In our opinion, this is one of the biggest places to do it. Whether it's a formal approval process or a non-formal process, um, you need to consider the workflow of receiving a brand new material. Requires approval. The SDS really should be part of that. So that's you can check it right off the list. We're done. We've got the, the we've got the initials. It was done by probably the person that requested it, and we're game ahead. The problem can come in is if I have one system that's managing my approvals as part of that, my person logs in, and they fill out a form, or sometimes it's just a SharePoint form or an email form. I put in the information. I attach the SDS. They make their decision. I get my approval back. And now the stuff is going to show up on site. Well, where's the SDS now? Right, so back to disconnected. We really need to have something in place that if someone goes out and does the job of initially getting the SDS for something they want, they get the approvals, that should filter right into the next step, which is now that we're going to have it here, how do I get all the data from the SDS into the materials management system so that when it shows up on the receiving dock, that person is simply saying, yes, here's a label, and it's done. Um, initial acquisition is very important. Many times, um, over the past, we've had people want everything automatic. Hey, I've got an SDS system. Great. We have a lot of solutions out there that are integrated with SDS systems because it's critical to business. Um, and they <laughs> will assume that it's automatic. So I want the material to show up on my door, my shipping and receiving guy. I want them to hit that receive button and put a label on. And I want it to automatically know what the GHS classifications are because I need to label the container. Well, end of the day, even if you have a ma an automated system, you're working with the best SDS supplier or management company, um, it still takes some time to get the information if it's something brand new, or even just pass back the information if it's something that's already been um, indexed so that we can consume it. So at the end of the day, if you step back and know that at any time, if the minute or the minute before I ever place order on something, if I make sure I have the SDS in there, if I make sure I have the material defined the materials management system, and I've re removed all roadblocks from the data entry process because, again, it's it's too late um, if it's already shown up on the receiving dock and then you have some guy holding the materials because I still need to classify it and, hey, that's not my job, right? There's a lot of things that you can um, run into if not taking into account that part of the process. Sorry. Okay. Um, once you've established the initial part of the SES management part, part, it's important to have a process to find and ensure moving forward. As long as the material's on site, and everyone that knows that, you know, long afterwards that SES needs to be available, it needs to be updated. So if and when the supplier provides updates to it, the content changes, um, we need to access that document and get it stored. And then even when the chemical's gone and no longer on site, I still need to have it archived so that in the event um, we have to go back in time and see, you know, what were the hazards at the time of the material that was used, we can do so. So, you know, 
keeping track of key details. A lot of times people are like, I'll just stick the SDS in there. Well, if I'm not tracking the revision date of the SDS, I'm then required to open every SDS to look and see what the date is. So I want to make sure I can track a format, a dated format, so I can report against it, uh, maybe have a, an active work list that every year, you know, something that's past a 24-month period, maybe monthly, I just get a report of anything that's greater than two years old. So I actually have a list and I have a person identified who goes through, reviews those, checks with the supplier to see if there's a more current version. Because maybe, maybe you've ordered the material, you have it on site, um, it's good for five years and you're at three, year three, um, you wouldn't have just randomly got a new SDS, you'd have to seek it. So unless you're paying a third party to go out and do your management for SDSs, um, it's a process that you need to build and you need to understand who's responsible to make sure it's not duplicated across our various different groups. Um, even with a, an integrated solution, um, this can be difficult and time consuming. So we just want to make sure, again, it's considered critical, we have to do it. Um, and then last but not least is just making sure everyone has access. So when you're looking at various different solutions, what is the focus? You know, who can get in? If I have to have a username and password, it's not good enough because if the fire department shows up um, and then you need a report of everything that you have in the area that happens to be on fire um, and they want to know the safety information, you know, the details about it, um, they're not going to have a username and password. They're not going to wait while IT puts in a ticket to get a new account set up for firefighter, right? It's um, that's not good enough. So making sure that from an access perspective, this is the one piece that we want to make sure everyone has access to, make sure that there's features and functionality to ensure that people without username and passwords um, get access to the SCS part of the solution that you're selecting. So um, once everything's in the system, approved, um, in the system, it's up to date, got the SDS, I've got things labeled, I've got them out there. But the next biggest thing is ensuring that you're keeping it up to date. And as with everything else, um, maintenance is critical because no one wants to use a system that's not actually maintained. If I go look for some material that I need to use, I do a search, I find it, I'm like, great, I have what I need. Back next week, go to find it, and it's not actually there, it's not available. Um, now I'm behind. So keeping inventory up to date is extremely important. Um, we discussed how materials are entered, reviewed, and even approved. We've discussed how materials are received and labeled and delivered. Um, now we really need to understand how to review and determine who will interact with the inventory system on a day-to-day -day basis, because uh, that's often, you know, it changes. Inventory is not a static thing. I've met very, very few customers over the years that it comes in, it sits there, and it doesn't ever move. It's a constantly changing um, environment with chemical or materials management, whether it's biologicals, chemicals, supplies, um, things come and go, things get used up. Um, depending on how you're tracking it, you might be tracking because it's a very expensive material every tiny usage that you know when to order more and you're not just ordering ex excess, for example. Um, and what we need to ensure is that end users that are using the system can easily log in, search and find materials, and know that what they find in the system reflects what's actually in the inventory. And someone needs to ensure that those day-to-day -day actions or interactions with the product um, are taking place. So when you start to think about it, you know, you've got lab managers, so do they need to count? So what is their role going to be? Um, maybe they're responsible for doing a monthly reconciliation. Make sure that, hey, you guys can do whatever you want during the course of the month. At the end of the month, I'm going to do a quick, a quick true up scan all the inventory, make sure everything's in place, and go on about our business. That might be one way that um, someone operates. Um, one lab um, might track things down to the lab level. So, For example, in my lab, I might just say, as long as you tell me it's in the lab, then I can do my reports, we can find stuff, and it's on me to have to know if it's in the fume hood or on my bench or in there, but as long as the system knows it's just in the lab, so I'm meeting safety requirements by reporting that it's here, people need to have access to the SDS from a um, fire code perspective, we know how much is there for this lab being part of a specific zone, then I own where it is within the lab. And that's okay. Some people are completely okay with that. Um, but and that really reduces the amount of interactions required to keep the inventory up to date. For very different reasons, for example, tracking large quantities of small volumes, if you think about the freezer example, um, you might want to track down the individual space in a freezer box, and it's critical that all movements tracked. You know, so all of a sudden it's the same 
it could be even the same user group, but because it's a different material type, it has different requirements, we're going to actually interact with the software differently. Um, some users will include locations on containers. So it was interesting. We you know, Sometimes we'll go out in the field and, and meet with customers and see if they've done very interesting things to make things work that have nothing to do with software. Um, one such customer went and they, even though most of the time we say do not put locations on containers, because what we found over time is that um, you put location on there because you think that's helpful. And then we find out five years from now, the system's been passed from hand to hand to hand. And um, now we have someone that prints a label for a container every single time they move it. That's really not the intention of any solution that would be out there. Um, so we've had some people that just say, that's fine. I'm just going to say that this container resides in this location, and I'll put that on the container. And in the event that you take the container, you have within the business day to use it, do whatever you want with it. And if you have a question of where it goes back to, you just look at the container and put it back. So from a process perspective outside the software, it's very easy. And then like we talked about a minute ago, the lab manager can simply do an audit at the end of the month and just make sure that, hey, people are using stuff, they take it over to the rent, they perform their experiment, and then they put it back. It's very, very easy, very little reaction. But if you did that flip side thing again, it's okay, well, now I'm talking about controlled substances. Every microgram of the stuff needs to be accounted for. I need to know who took it and when they took it and anything they did with it, whether it was just simply a move from um, the vault to a locked cabinet in a lab, or if it was taken out of a locked head of the lab, cabinet of a lab, spent for use, we lost a little bit on the pipette. Um, I need to account for every single step. So, um, really looking at who is going to be involved, how they're going to interact based on the types of materials using is key in helping build the right SOPs based on the need of the specific lab um, is very important. So a lot of stuff goes into keeping it up to date, and there's lots of ways to streamline and make this very, very simple. Um, and then there's cases where you can't. It's actually, because you need those advanced audit trails, there is a lot more interaction and day-to-day -day use. This has been critical for a long time. A lot of it comes to just having the right data field. If I, um, I mentioned before about the SDS revision date, you know, if I put it in the system in such a way that it's stored and I can report on it, then I can easily access things and make reports, work on just the set that needs focus. Um, that's true also of expi expiring materials. And a lot of stuff, it doesn't matter. I would never care about the expiration date. If I didn't have 100 years, I never care. There's other materials that are much more critical, um, like peroxide formers, where I want to know not only um, when the manufacturer said they were set to expire, but if they're opened, the fact that that expiration date changed. A lot of people will still tell us, well, that's, that's fine. I've got a researcher. They open the bottle. When they open it, and write the new expiration date on the container. Don't touch that container for six months. How do you know it expired? So being able to leverage a system um, that is smart enough to understand that you have these things that are ever-changing, and there's a difference between a receipt date and expiration date, an open expiration date, and that the intervals might change if we're tracking all that information, being able to simply run reports to notify people, either whether it's the researcher or owner of the product or the lab manager or safety, you know, maybe you have different levels of notification, let you know three weeks in advance that your thing is expiring, and let your, let your boss know two weeks in advance it's expiring. Now EHS is getting a notification because it's not only expired, but it's still sitting there and no one's done anything about it. So there's ways to account for and keep track to make sure that you're um, that your end users are safe and that we're monitoring these things in real time. So a lot of things that go into it. Um, I think that I've been talking a lot. I apologize. I'm going fast. Um, there's so much that goes into selecting inventory. Um, the last piece that I wanted to highlight was really um, integration with related systems. And this is probably the biggest thing. Um, at the end of the day, we focused, I focused, and talked a lot about the challenges of selecting into a management system. Um, but when I look at this diagram, my world exists over here under resources, materials. I wanted to point that out just because it's, it's very small. And if I think about the landscape of a lab and all the varied systems that can be there from procurement to SDS, you know, those are the ones we've talked about. Um, but request systems, I need this material, um, defining procedures or methods, you know, when I test this material or when I define and create create this material, this is the procedure I need to um, run. These are all my input materials. These, this is my output material. Um, those all connect to the inventory system. 
So when I hear it's just inventory, it's like, yeah, but it's just inventory that everything else you do is based on. And so taking that step back and saying, yes, it's important that I track hazardous materials. It's important that I know um, which lot is in a specific box in a freezer. It's important that I can produce total quantities based on controlled area, right? And I have all the right people involved in all the processes and the approvals. That's all great. Um, but at the end of the day, you still want to think about on the larger scale, how does this piece now play into my overall laboratory software environment and, you know, is it connected? If I have to, again, retype that name, hope that I get it right, and if I go to use it, I'm um, executing a batch and I'm using a little bit of acetone, a little bit of whatever else, you know, which lot did it come from? So as I start doing testing and see anomalies between the testing, which material did it come from, which lot was it based on, um, going back and be able to trace and pull back, um, it's critical. It's critical to understand how the just inventory system works in the broader picture um, of the solution that you deploy. I apologize, I'm looking at the time. I think I've ran over um, a little bit. But in summary, I tried to summarize it shortly. You know, understanding all the requirements, not just yours, but the broader group. Um, consider who's involved. Everybody, EHNS, researchers, biological, chemicals, um, facilities management, any, anybody. Uh, review the entire landscape, so what's currently being used, how is it being used, how does it interact with the other systems that we're using, what's working, what's not, and think long term. You know, we have people today that are still using Excel. We have people that are using homegrown systems um, that, you know, go back to Bob Smith. Bob Smith created 15 years ago and it's still limping along and um, one of the days it's not going to limp along anymore and you'll, you'll be stuck. So look at a broad picture of where, you know, where can I get a solution that will continue growing and has the backing and production and development teams to um, continue driving that development. I think that's everything I had to share. I apologize if I talk a little fast. I was a little excited. Um, questions? Let me know. Okay, thanks, Anne. Uh, it looks like we have just a few minutes for questions. Uh, just a reminder if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send it to all panelists. Uh, we have one question so far, Ann, and that is, if I want to implement a chemical inventory system, what's the best way to start the process? Best way, obviously, if we talk about right after selecting a solution um, is, and this, this is probably the hardest thing, is people want to assume that I can just start from day one and start receiving stuff at entry. Um, it's really not the case. Um, most of the time we will work with customers to um, identify a process, whether it's just the people in the organization, which can actually be hard because everyone still has their jobs, or bringing in a third party. There's a lot of companies out there like um, Unity Lab Services and BWR Catalyst that will actually send out teams um, to help you roll out an inventory system, which means I want someone there, boots on the ground. They're going to spend the next month or two months, depending on how large your inventory is, um, ignoring. And I, only, I only say ignoring what you currently have because most of the time, taking what, what's in an old system and trying to migrate it, although we can do it, we do it all the time, um, can actually cause more work in terms of cleanup versus just saying, I'm going to actually bring a dedicated team in. They're going to put boots on the ground. They're going to physically touch, label, do the data entry, task the SDS um, for the inventory system so that you have a go live point that actually starts with everything in the system. There's a common misconception. It's like, I'll just start at the door. If you start at the door and just start putting stuff in that's coming through the door, I promise you it'll take you 20 years to get caught up and you will find all kinds of things. So um, consider whether it's internal or third party, um, do a boots on the ground initial inventory to get everything in the system as part of the rollout of your new solution. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. My thanks to Anne Seafried for her presentation, to Dassault Systems for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants. We do have one new Synergist webinar planned for early next month. On November 6th, Bulwark will present a town hall webinar to answer your top questions about flame resistant and chemical protective clothing. You can register for this event at aiha.webvent.tv. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. All right. Thank you, everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. 
And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.